your benefit. That was like a, a well-timed short story. <laughs> because in the beginning, the consistency and steadiness of God in pursuing him and just the occasional heartbeat of his. And then the increased fervency on God's part and his, and then in the end, <laughs> so that bass was his heart and you heard it continuing at the end beautiful it was like a well written short story so thank you for finishing the story <laughs> amen amen I have to tell you, I'm feeling a little edgy. I, I think you're going to get a taste of what first service usually gets, and they haven't gotten lately. Um, so we'll just see where that leads. I have no agenda, but I'm feeling, um, I don't know. We'll have to judge and see what the Lord's going to do. If you are a believer and you've not been formally discipled, I encourage you to go through the Harvester's Handbook with someone who's already been through it. It's no matter how long you've been in the faith, it will shore up your foundation and you will grow. Tammy Connor grew up in church. She was our coordinator for the program at one time, and she said she couldn't believe what she was learning when she went through this, and I don't think that she's unique. So if you've not been through this with someone, Jay, would you stand up, please? Jay is the coordinator. He'll help you find someone to work with. Um, there, you need to go through it with someone else who's already been through it. It's a mentoring relationship. And so I encourage you to do that. Cool. I still have a key up here, and I don't know where that came from. Would you please turn to Luke chapter 1? We're beginning a Christmas series called The Christmas Story. And today's message is He's Coming from Luke 1. Please invite people who don't usually go to church and have them come hear the Christmas story each week. It'll be a different message each week. I will tell you up front, I'm acknowledging something that I'm going to do. I am going to follow the traditional Christmas story order, not necessarily the biblical Christmas story order. And you'll see what that means. And I'm doing that for people who come to church who don't usually come and don't know the difference. And if they may learn the difference, we'll get there. Luke chapter 1. If you'd stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. If you get tired, feel free to be seated because there are 80 verses. I'm not going to read all 80 verses, but I am going to read a healthy portion. Starting at verse 5. <clears throat> if you've never read Luke, this will be your introduction. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. And while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense of altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will, share, he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. 
the angel of the Lord said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be filled, be filled at the proper time. Skip down to verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. <clears throat> Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And so then Mary goes to see Elizabeth, and when she walks in, the baby inside Elizabeth leaps for joy. Mary sings a song of praise, and then we pick up in verse 57. When it was the time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name Zechariah after his father, but Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? They exclaimed. There's no one in all your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. And instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. Awe fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Let's read that again. Awe fell upon the whole neighborhood. Awe fell upon the whole neighborhood. Awe fell upon the whole neighborhood. And the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Zechariah, he gives a prophecy. Let's skip down to verse 76, partway through his prophecy. And he says, And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and then the shadow of death to guide us to the path of peace. John grew up and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Pastor Joe, ask the Lord to give you some fire for the end. I'm serious. I feel like the enemy is present, and he's present because of what some people are believing in the church. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to cover those who are here who are born again. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, that you'd cover us with the blood of Christ. And Father, we, in Jesus' name, we bind the forces of darkness. We command them to silence so that everyone here can hear the truth and be free. Lord, we ask that you would instill hope even in those who are captive and bound in this hour, that they would be freed before the hour is over. In Jesus' name, Lord, we say you have all authority and you have authority here in our lives and in this place. And we ask you to bring glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name. We command every enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave this place and to go where Jesus has already commanded you to go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
We praise you and bless you, Father. We praise you and bless you, Lord. We praise you and bless you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord. Amen. If you go ahead and be seated, I'm going to explain myself. Because that could be pretty weird and seem, if you're a visitor, it could seem weird. If you're not a visitor, it could seem like I've lost my grip and my egg is cracked. The yolk is coming out on the floor. So let me explain myself. I know from personal experience, and I know from the Word of God, that most spiritual warfare takes place in our minds. I do not believe that a person who is filled with this Holy Spirit can be possessed by an, the enemy. But the enemy definitely oppresses Christians through lies that we believe. And the enemy, he understands the Scripture as well as we do, where God says, do not give the enemy a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. Do not give the enemy a foothold. And so when we sin, we give the devil a foothold. And that means he gains territory. He stands there. And God, no matter how many times you ask God to deliver you, the enemy will not go away until you submit to God and resist the devil. Someone, anyone who's suicidal is being influenced by the demonic world. I know that for a fact. I've seen people delivered in an instant. Any negative thoughts like that are demonically hosted. And that's why I just, I know that the enemy is present. And God is not going to, be, it is the responsibility of a Christian. No one can deliver you from the enemy without you deciding you want to be delivered. And that requires repentance. So, have I explained myself? So I'm not weird, I'm biblical. Maybe that makes me weird. <laughs> Friends who know me know I'm weird anyway. <laughs> it's true, Maria, it's true. So, Penny, you can help me when I can't find my Bible. It's right here. You can say, when I look like I don't know where I'm going, it's because I don't know where it is. And you can say, it's right here, Sam. We struggle. Many of us in this room, we struggle. We struggle with a lot of things. I have a knee that has decided to give me trouble. Doctor said it's just as well I don't run. I hate running. <laughs> he said walking's good. There are those of us who here who have other issues, physical. There are those of us here who struggle with depression. There are those of us here who feel like we have more bad days than good. There are others who feel like life is just sweet. But even you have your Lord down dump days. Amen? Won't it be nice when the day comes when we don't have to worry? Some of you, you wouldn't say life is bad. You just There are things that gnaw at you and worry you. There are a lot of things to, that are, can be on our mind. I've done, well, at the end of this week, I'll have done four funerals in five weeks. And it's unusual, but I know everyone that I'm doing a funeral for. And I know the families quite well. So it's, this is an unusual season, and it's been, it's been this way all year. I know that this year has been difficult on this body. But our lives are different than the people's lives were 2,000 years ago. Do you want to know why? Imagine having the loneliness, the, the physical pain, the concerns about death, the, the issues that are, are in our lives, the things that make life difficult. Imagine all those things, but having no hope of Jesus Christ. Having no hope of Jesus Christ. I remember what my life was like before I received Christ. I wasn't raised a Christian. I remember, I remember those days, and I remember what brought me to my knees so that when God brought believers into my life, I was ready. And I, I tell you, I have nowhere else to go but Jesus. I have no one else to go to. I, have, I remember what life was like, and I don't want to go back there. But even I believed that there was a God. At that time, I questioned if he were real, if there really is a God. I knew the devil was real. I wasn't sure God was real. 
But the people I'm talking about 2,000 years ago are like a lot of people around us today. A lot of people don't know anything. If you're my age, we make the assumption that everyone knows something about the Bible, Jesus, or God. But the reality is that younger people know absolutely nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing about Jesus, the Bible, or God, or religion. Except they don't like religion. (laughs) Or maybe they think all religions are equal. Go back 2,000 years ago before Jesus was born. They had the same troubles, the same issues, same fears, same dread, same heaviness, same highs and lows that you and I do, same cancers, same... Everything was the same. Because there's nothing new under the sun. But Jesus hadn't been born. See, on our worst day, when we come up for air, we can say, Jesus, help me. We can say, I get a new body and I'm going to heaven. On the worst day, we can say, Lord, take me now. I've had enough because I know where I'm going. Do you know what I mean? Right? I'm not being fatalistic. I'm not being suicidal. I was like, Lord, come back now. But those folks didn't have that. Jesus had not come. Most of the people in that day didn't know God. Most of the people in that day didn't know, they didn't know God. The people who were religious leaders weren't doing a very good job. Most of them were not tender, sincere, kind people. They were harsh and legalistic and mean in a church that you wouldn't want to go to. And you could never, you could never live up to their expectations to be good enough to feel like you were going to make it to heaven. In that day, they didn't have any reason for hope. And yet, there was a rumor there was, there was talk. There was tradition. There was some fantasy world that some people thought might be true that there was a Messiah. That there would be a man who would be born who was going to deliver the people of Israel. And in fact, they didn't understand it at the time, but people like Job did. That it wasn't just the Jews who could be saved, who could have a relationship with God. There was a rumor, but it was a pretty quiet rumor. The end of the book of the Old Testament, the end of the Old Testament, the last book was Malachi, and it closes with a prophecy. Look, this is the Lord. I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, it will come and strike the land with a curse. And then there's silence. For thousands of years, God had been speaking to his people. And then they went through a period of 400 years where God didn't speak to them. Absolute silence. And there are some terrible things that happened to Israel in those 400 years. So they're living day to day without hope. They have the same frustrations, fears, depressions, highs and lows, blues, taxes and death, cancer and sickness, Terrible things that people do to one another. But there was this rumor. Despite 400 years of silence, there was this rumor that there was going to be a Messiah, a Savior. And the rumor was, he's coming. But they had no reason to hope. Who's God? That's what this Christmas story is about. That's what what we celebrate at Christmas, is that hope came. The rumor was true. The Messiah was real. The Savior was real. And He came. It's true. 2,000 years ago, chapter 1 of Luke records the earliest Recognition, the Messiah was coming. Would you say with me, he's coming? He's coming. He was coming 2,000 years ago, but he hadn't gotten to earth yet. He came and he stepped on this earth. Now he comes to us individually, personally, and he knocks on the door and we have to let him in. We have to say, Jesus, please be my Lord and Savior. And at that moment, he comes to live inside us, and his Father lives inside us. That's what he says in John, the Gospel of John. But he's still coming. 
For we who are Christians, he is still coming. The second coming, when he puts an end to death and suffering in the injustices of the world and we get new bodies. He's coming. Do you get it? He was coming, he's coming, he's still coming. He is coming. This is what God wants you to hear. Hope in Jesus. On your darkest day, when things get you most despondent, most discouraged, most hopeless, hope in Jesus. It's a choice we make. Would you say with me, hope in Jesus? Jesus. Now it says hope in God, but I'm, I'm being even more specific because there are a lot of people who believe in God who don't know Jesus. I believed in God, wasn't raised in church, but I believed there was a God until I got to the point where I questioned that. But I never knew him. There's a difference between believing in God and having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A huge difference. Hope in Jesus. That's a choice we make. Why? Two reasons that I can give you out of this first chapter of Luke to hope in Jesus. And I'll tell you both of them right up front. Because he remembers and because he moves. Let's talk about his remembering. He remembers The Christmas story is so very important because of prophecy. Would you say with me, prophecy? Prophecy. Prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is when God speaks to a person and gives that person a message to give to others. That's all. He doesn't take them over. Spirit of the prophet is always under control of the prophet. If Justin is given prophetic word, he's in control. He cooperates with the Holy Spirit. He decides whether to speak or not to speak. But God, don't ever tell me God took you over, and you won't. But I have people tell me that. They don't tell me that anymore. (laughs) Not me, anyway. They may tell someone else that. Prophecy. God remembers his word. Throughout the Old Testament, there are prophetic utterings that God gave to his people. Beginning in Genesis, well, Genesis was to the whole world when Adam and Eve sinned and sin and death entered the world. God prophesied, he said to Adam and Eve that their seed of Eve would crush the serpent's head. He said his peel would get bitten too. That's the earliest prophetic utterance about Christ. There's, as you search through the scriptures, there are 400 references to Christ in the Old Testament, whether they're appearances, foreshadowings, or prophecies. When Jesus came, over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament were fulfilled. Jesus was talked about so much in the Old Testament. If you read through the Old Testament, get a good study Bible, get the fire Bible, and it will help you find those prophecies those references, those appearances of Christ. God remembers what he has prophesied. The last words were, I will send you someone in the spirit of Elijah who will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. God remembered that. And he repeats it in John or Luke chapter 1. When he says about John the Baptist, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And, he, and, and, the Gabriel, and Gabriel tells Zechariah, your son will be moving in the power and spirit of Elijah. Who was Elijah? Elijah was a great prophet in the Old Testament. He was prophesying. He was bringing God's truth. Let's talk about what prophecy is first. Prophecy is two things. Prophecy can be truth-telling. Jeremiah told the people who were leading the nation at the time that he was alive, you people are wicked, idolaters, and you're doing terrible things truth. But prophecy also is future telling. Chapter 53 of Isaiah talks about the suffering serpent. Servant. It's all about Jesus. Micah tells us about Jesus coming. And Malachi finishes his book saying that there's going to be a fellow coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was very significant. The end of the clo- at the end of Malachi, the Jews were expecting Elijah to return. They're looking. They even asked John the Baptist when he's preaching, are you Elijah? They were looking for him. He was the one, he was one of two people when Jesus was transfigured. Mark chapter 9. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
with James, Peter, and John. His raiments, his clothes were changed to white, and Moses and Elijah appeared to them. So real that, that Peter offered to build each of them a place to stay. That's Elijah. God remembered those words. He didn't forget them. What are the other words that he remembered? Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. He spoke to Abraham before the nation of Israel was formed. And God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And here's the best part. This was a promise. He's speaking to Abraham, who's an old man. His wife can't have children. He has not had one child. They're old people. They're elderly. He says, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. That's not just the Jews. All families. That's a direct reference to Christ. Another prophecy. This to King David, 2 Samuel 7, 16. God said to David, your house and your kingdom will continue before me. What, for just through Solomon? For all time. And your throne will be secure for tomorrow? Forever. How can it be secure forever? Because he wasn't talking about a man. He was talking about Christ. Those are prophecies, and God did not forget the prophecies. Would you say with me, he's coming? Can you say hope in Jesus? First reason, because he remembers. He remembers his prophecies. He remembers the promises that he gave to Abraham, to, all, to Adam and Eve, to David, to the, tr- the tribes of Israel, to us. He remembers his promises. And so he was saying, I remember and I'm going to fulfill them. But not only does he remember his promises, we find in this chapter that God remembers individuals. He says, Gabriel says to Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. Isn't that cool? He remembered Elizabeth. He remembered Zechariah. He remembers you and you. He remembers you, David, and you, Michael. He remembers you, Ailey. He remembers you, Lindsay. He remembers me. He remembers every one of us. He remembers us. He can't forget us. We're engraved in the palm of his hand. Isaiah says, he remembers you. Penny, he remembers you. Do you believe it? Yeah, I know you do. He does. Let me take this a little further. Would you say, Jesus remembers me? Folks, when you feel most discouraged, when you feel like, Lord, you have forgotten me, and you begin to feel like your head is going underwater and you can't breathe, that is the enemy trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Did I say that right, Annette? Steal, kill, and destroy. Folks, the best thing you can do is say the truth aloud for your own ears to hear. Jesus remembers me. Would you say it one more time? Jesus remembers me. And say that. Say it as many times as you need to to encourage yourself. We knew a a couple when we first met them years ago, started attending a church who could not have children. Julie. But God remembered her. God remembered her. May come back to that one. You can remind me when we get done. God remembers his promises to you. Now, sometimes, this is a caution, sometimes we see promises in the Bible or we take Scripture and we try to make promises for ourselves that God doesn't give us. And if we set ourselves up, don't expect God to answer. Take the promises that God gives you. Sometimes we think he's making a promise to us. Well, folks, we may not understand it or we're misreading the text. He's only responsible to keep the promises that he's made that he intends, not the ones that you want to claim. Everybody okay? I have new good news. He's coming. And the second reason to have hope, to hope in Jesus, is that he moves. Now, when I say he moves, how many of you here know what I mean? But you know what? If I go out there and talk to somebody, I go up to the quick fill and I say to Mindy down there at the quick fill, Jesus moves. What do you think she's going to think? She's going to flatline. It's like, he moves. Yeah, so what? What's that mean? 
You know what it means because if you ask God to do something for you and he doesn't do it, he hasn't moved. But when he does do it, he has moved. Isn't that true? When God answers your prayer, you say God has moved. Start thinking about, I need six volunteers, but don't pop up yet. I need six volunteers, but don't pop up yet. He moves by, first, preparing us for what he's going to do. He spoke to Zechariah, and he said, Zechariah, you're going to have a son. If I'd been Zechariah, I'd have been like Zechariah, and I'd have said, yeah, right. Notice, they were praying for a child. And the Bible says very explicitly, they're old people. Right? They're elderly. They're along in age. They're not middle-aged. They're older than middle-aged. Do you think that they were praying for children at that point? Say they were 7 or 80. If you were 7 or 80 years old, would you be praying for a child? (laughs) Absolutely not. No matter how much you want to have children, you wouldn't be praying when you're 70 or 80. You probably stop time when you're 40 or 45 or at the most maybe 50. But most of us don't want to have children when we're 70 or 80 that are infants. Unless you're crazy and in Hollywood, right? I'm sorry, that was really out there. They had probably quit praying for a child by the time Gabriel came. And then the angel comes at an age when we're not conceiving. And much more than that, we don't even want to conceive. Because, you know... How long are you going to live? And you're told you're going to have a child. Can you imagine if Gabriel hadn't told them they were going to have children? Elizabeth wakes up one morning and she has morning sickness. A few weeks later, her stomach starts to show. And Zechariah looks at her and she looks at him and they think they're going to lose their mind. And she's a little cantankerous and he can't understand it. And their world is upset. See, God prepared them for the fact they were going to have a child. And I would be willing to... Gamble that God allowed them to live long enough to raise John. Right? Because he, had a, he, had, he came with baggage. Can't drink any alcohol. You know, all this extra stuff. They had to teach him. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Think about Mary. He prepared her. You're a virgin. You wake up with morning sickness. And your stomach starts to show. It's like, Who did something to me when I was sleeping? (laughs) While you were sleeping? Has a new meaning. That was an old movie. Ah. God prepared her. Prepared both of them and said, these children, these boys are going to be very special. He prepared them. But even more, he prepares. And, you know, so he prepares us for life change. Think about some big changes you've had in your life. Did God prepare you sometimes? I think more often than that. Now, there are times when he doesn't, but often he prepares us for things that are coming. If you look back, you can say, you can see where it's like, oh, you know, God was doing something, and I wasn't, I didn't realize what he was doing that helped me to be ready for this moment. How many can say that? Yes. He didn't send Gabriel probably to anybody here. But he prepares us for life change. He also prepares us for Christ. We find it when Gabriel goes to Zechariah. We find it (laughs) when Zechariah prophesies at the end. John the Baptist is being sent. He's He's born before Christ. He's being sent to the people to prepare them for the Lord, to soften their hearts. These are people who haven't been thinking on God. They probably don't like religion. That sounds like some people I know. They're, they're, they're crusty. They're the mechanics of the world. They're the farmers of the world. They're the cafeteria workers of the world. These are the ones that Jesus came to. He didn't come to the religious leaders. He came to the truck drivers. He came to the people who work in the office. And you have to deal with nice people in your case, but some of you people deal with people who aren't so nice. Right? And he came to say, repent. God is real. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from before birth. He spoke with a power that they didn't recognize. And he was telling them, think about God and think about getting your lives right because 
there's somebody coming after me who's more powerful. And Jesus came, and their hearts were made tender before he got there, so that when he got there, God brought me to my knees before Galen and Andy told me about Jesus. He, he prepared me for salvation by allowing me to go through those terrible things, by calling Bob home, by calling two other men home in two weeks. You know, that helped make me soft. So that when Galen and Andy came and told me about Christ, it's like, I am ready. I'm ready to get out of this mess. Amen? Amen. But not only does God move by preparing, he also moves by doing what men called impossible. Think about it. The woman who's old age, in old age, who's barren, has a child. The virgin has a child. Those things are impossible according to men. You know, science, yeah, science could do something for the woman who's infertile, who's old, older, right? But we call it impossible, don't we? What else does he do that's impossible? Three things, I think. Salvation transformation, healing. Those three things are impossible. Think about people you know that you never thought would be saved who are saved today. You know, I made a list from in 2014. There were some surprising salvations. Kirsten Powers from Fox News became a believer. Derwin Gray, never heard of him. He's a football player. Nabil Qureshi, Muslim, an evangelistic Muslim trying to convert Americans to Islam, got saved and became an evangelist before he died in September. 34 years old, he passed away. But he, that's, he got saved. That's a miracle. And he got transformed. How much more a miracle is that? Now he's contending for the faith. Rosario Butterfield. I told you about her, those who were here a couple of years ago. She was a Syracuse University professor. She was a lesbian. She was very active in the lesbian lifestyle and the agenda that some have. And she, she, today she saved and she actually attended church with some people that we used to attend church when we were first believers. We went up to Syracuse. And some of those people helped minister to her. And today she's born again. She, read her books. Rosaria Butterfield. Rosario Butterfield. Wonderful testimony. Transformation. Salvation. People here have been healed. Supernaturally, John Connor, first service. Anybody here not know that story? Come on, raise your hand. Okay. John Connor, several years ago, he was dizzy, he had vertigo, he was nauseous. John Connor is 10 years younger than I am or, or younger than that even, and he's in shape, he's an electrician. When he works, he's like lightning. He's good at what he does, but he had vertigo, he was nauseous, he was dizzy, it was dangerous for him to climb on ladders. He went through every test the doctors had for months. I think for a year he battled it. They finally said, you're going to have to live with this the rest of your life. And then in a service here, when Tim Bennett was here once, Tim, uh, John was, I guess he'd come to the altar, and he started hooping and hollering, Aah! it didn't sound like that, but it was loud, louder. God touched him and healed him immediately. And he's been healed ever since. Can I use your foot? In April, there was a word of knowledge. People with feet come up and get prayer. Penny's feet were hurting her tremendously. And they had been for some time before that. Like a few weeks. I don't remember how long. And God touched your feet. Now, are they completely, you know, God's got to do something more. But, but that pain that she was living with, God took away that day and hasn't returned. She said, Amen. You know, God heals. He, he moves. Oh, I missed the physical illustration. We won't try to knock people over. I won't ask for the volunteers. Oh, well. God moves. Hope in Jesus. Why? He came once. He's come twice if you're saved. And he lives inside you. And he's coming again. He's coming again. He is coming. He is coming. And he says, hope in him. When you feel discouraged, say, and you feel like he's lost sight of you, say, Jesus remembers me. One last time. Jesus when you're discouraged and you feel like, you know, there's no point, you can't, there's no 
life is overwhelming, say, God is awesome. Will you just remember those two things and say them aloud? Jesus remembers me. Jesus is awesome. God is awesome. Say those two things aloud and keep rehearsing them in your mind. And your spirit will get build up because God's word says the truth sets us free. And those are based on scripture. Amen. Isaiah, you're, you're engraved on the palm of his hand. He remembers you. He remembers you. He is awesome. Oh, all the Bible declares the awesomeness of God. Would you stand with me, please? Pastor Joe, would you get ready?